live from Austin, Texas, it's theCUBE, covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 2017. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Linux Foundation, and theCUBE's ecosystem partners. Hey, welcome back everyone here live at theCUBE in Austin, Texas for KubeCon. 2017, second annual conference of the Kubernetes conference. I'm John Furrier with my co-student member. We have Ben Sigelman, who's the CEO of Lightstep. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you so much. So you're also uh, involved in OpenTracer, all the stuff with Service Mesh. Really instrumental tech work going on right now mm -hmm. at yeah. this Kubernetes con. I mean, obviously Kubernetes has been successful. People are now learning for it the first time in mainstream. But it's really galvanized the community at many levels. And I haven't seen this much action, uh, and so fast. Um, up and down the stack. Mm -hmm. And you got the infrastructure plumbing guys and you got the app plumbing guys all building really, really fast. What's the state of the union? Give us, give us a peek of what's happening, what's solid, what's foundational, what are the building blocks that are, that are being built on and what's the current task of jobs being worked on, projects and whatnot? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I was, uh, emerged my hotel room yesterday just to get on the elevator, and then Kelsey Hightower emerged from his hotel room, it turns out two doors down from me, <laughs> and we're walking in the elevator together. I'm like, hey, you know, so, you know, what's your big, what's your big announcement? He's so good on stage, and he's a brilliant communicator, and he's like, you know, honestly, like, the big news right now is that actually there's not that much news from a release standpoint about Kubernetes, which is actually a really big deal. It's gotten to a point where its feature, its feature set is actually appropriate and somewhat stable, and now we finally are to the point where it's, I think it has a, a really natural architecture for plugins and extensions, and now we can build this entire ecosystem around it. Instead of building around uh, something that's a bit of a moving target, I think it's incredible how, it, it, it's truly incredible to see this conference over the last couple of years. So these foundational elements are in place. Yeah. That's just kind of interesting. Yeah, exactly, and it's incredible to see how much of, um, not just a commercial ecosystem, but a technology ecosystem that's built around those primitives. Because so I think they really are the right primitives to democratize the pieces that should be democratized and to centralize the pieces that should be centralized. So to me, this year is really about going a level up in the stack and, um, and delivering value that's uh, beyond you know, the container Kubernetes level, and that's what a lot of the projects that I'm excited about are doing yeah, here. So Ben, I mean, that leads right into one of the things we've been talking about all week here, service meshes. Yeah. Uh, so you, you gave a keynote yesterday, maybe give our audience a little bit about you know, service meshes, observability, and there's something about a pigeon. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was very funny. I, I, uh, I just the reference at the pigeon. I the, the first slide in my talk was a picture of a murmuration of starlings. This beautiful cloud of birds moving in harmony. And while I was waxing on about how this represented microservices, an actual bird flew above me on stage. There's a <laughs> pigeon trapped in this room, <laughs> and so everyone started laughing. I didn't know it was so <laughs> funny. I'm like, you what know, a what, great like, demo. what did I do wrong? I'm like, <laughs> you know, do I have a do I have a, a note on my back or something? And then the the hilarious thing is the second slide was actually the, the operational experience of deploying this sort of microservice technology is actually very difficult. And so it was a slide from Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds with this, you know, these birds attacking this poor child. And so, and the bird is still circling around above me. It was, it was perfect stagecraft. I wish I had tried to do it. It would have been amazing to take credit for arranging an actual live animal as part of my presentation. But in terms of the actual material in the presentation, which may be less entertaining than the bird flying around my head, but the material of the presentation is something I feel very strongly about, and I alluded to this a moment ago, I, I think that containers are incredibly important. I think Kubernetes is incredibly important, and I'm extraordinarily confident that in 10 years they're going to be everywhere. That said, they're not something an application developer really should care that deeply about as part of their job of writing business logic for the service that they are maintaining and developing. That shouldn't be a layer that they care about. And there are a lot of really, really important problems that crop up at the application layer. At Google, the way we address this was by having uh, not a monolithic um, architecture, but a monolithic software repository where everyone developed in the same code base. But one of the things I thought was interesting about being at Google, if you wanted to deploy an application, even something that just printed out hello world or something, it was like an 150 megabyte binary because there's so much stuff that was crammed into level seven user level stuff. And 
that was right for Google. It's not really the best architecture for a lot of enterprises out there. And I think what's so cool about Service Mesh is that it's taken a bunch of really genuinely hard computer science problems, like service discovery, um, connection and load balancing and uh, reconnection, health checks, security and authentication, um, observability and tracing. These are really hard things to do well, and it's factored them off into a sidecar that you can run alongside ordinary applications that were not even developed with that in mind and take advantage of these application level, level seven primitives. We've had people who are trying to build solutions for any number of managerial and, and monitoring tasks at the container level where often that stuff is completely obscured. Like by the time you're at the kernel, you can't see any of this stuff. If you're up at level seven in the service mesh, you have easy access to application level data, which makes everything a lot more elegant and straightforward for developers. So it's like, to me, it's this, yeah. it's this uh, single point of integration that, that removes a bunch of hard computer science problems from ordinary application development. Uh, and that's a wonderful And so people point. were stuffing containers basically and trying to overdrive that. Um, makes total sense architecturally. I wanted to take a step back and kind of let's unpack that a little bit. We didn't get here by accident. We got here through real hard work. I mean, people were out there building from open source large scale systems. Yeah. Uber, Lyft, and a handful of other examples. What was the driver around this? Because you're talking about a really elegant architecture that allows for solving a problem for the guys that solve their own problem. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of transactions, services, millions of transactions per second. Yeah. So this was not like, hey, let's just design a new like, system. It was some scar tissue. Yeah. How does that connect to like reality now for whether it's a startup saying, hey, you know, we're a couple years old, we're on AWS and we're growing and I want to add more value, but I want to relearn machine learning. I want to, I want to build on other stuff and create business value mm -hmm. for my enterprise, growing yeah. enterprise, or a big enterprise that's trying to be cloud native. Yeah. So that's, how, how should someone think about that? And what specifically was the problem that was solved? Yes. Well, I'm an obsessive person, I'll admit that, and I'm personally obsessed with performance, and so when I think about this, I actually think about profiling the engineers who are building this stuff. You know, you have developers, let's profile them, like what are they spending their time on? Because that's really a precious resource right now, right? It's like it's hard to even hire people fast enough, right? So if you think about profiling people, you have folks that are spending a lot of time uh, trying to get their services to communicate properly, to authenticate, to observe these systems in a, in a way that's sane. And so it's only natural you try to factor that out and make, it, uh, and make that factored out. You try to amortize the cost of solving that problem across your entire organization. And I think that you've seen people who've, who've been at other companies and want to recreate something like what they had at Google or Facebook or Twitter, what have you, but they want to do it in a way that meshes with their existing systems. I'm actually not surprised that super, super young companies that are starting with the true greenfield code base move in this direction. What has been interesting to me, and although I shouldn't say surprising because it's actually very rational, but you also have companies that are much larger, and we, Lightstep has, you know, we have customers that are running a mainframe alongside legacy Java VMs, alongside microservices, and they're all working in concert to service application requests from end users. And these things Things need to talk to each other, and I think what's what's actually really fun for me. Google gets a lot of credit uh, for building things the right way. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but it's really funny because the problem is actually a lot more interesting outside of Google because you have to integrate with a much larger surface area. And the thing that's so exciting to me about a lot of the technologies that are really taking off here is that they were designed for that kind of heterogeneity. Um, certainly, I've talked about service mesh a million times already here. Um, open tracing is also exists specifically because of that heterogeneity. We didn't need open tracing at Google because everything was perfectly factored, so it was unnecessary. Outside of Google, it's necessary to have a common API to describe transactions as they propagate, because otherwise you can't make sense of anything that's happening in your application. Um, this sort of heterogeneity uh, has, has encouraged projects that standardize at the right layer, and I think those are the ones that are proliferating. What is the service mesh about now? I mean, how would you describe it? I mean, how would you define in the world of Kubernetes, in the world we're talking about, for someone to just getting, tech person getting started, what's the hubbub about with Service Mesh? What is it? Well, I, I mean, I think at the most basic level, it's, uh, it's something that sits in between any two processes that are communicating in your system. And it sits in between them at a layer where you can observe the application itself. Like you're able to access uh, um, application level security information, application level, um, uh, primitives like you know the particular path that you're hitting for any HTTP request, something like that. It's something that sits in between at that layer. Um, because microservices, uh, 
you know, I've seen Lyft up close because they're also a customer for Lightstep, and, and to see Envoy deployed at, at their company is really instructive. It's amazing, I mean, it's really amazing. I mean, they went from having uh, no integration with our product to having 100% integration with our product by flipping a configuration bit to on, you know? It's an, actually, it wasn't even on. They could do it by percentage. I mean, they can roll these things out with perfect, perfect precision. And I, I mean, it's an incredibly powerful thing to be able to have that kind of leverage over an entire architecture, and that didn't require all their developers to redeploy. This just required the service mesh to redeploy. So you can make these sorts of changes without touching application CI/CD stuff. You can do all these infrastructural level changes independently from application pushes, right, so and that's very powerful. So, hold on, I know Sue wants to get a question, but let's stop there for a second. Compare and contrast what the old way would have been. Yeah. What would have it have taken to do the similar concept that full team at Lyft, assuming they had another architecture? I've seen, I mean, uh, you know. Months, I, weeks, I, redeploys. I, we, so, you know, the model that I've seen at Google where we would make changes to software that was linked into every application would go out with the next release, we would make that change in some central place. I'd say 50% of the services would be deployed within a week, 90% within two weeks, but to get to 99% would take over a year. And so the issue is if you need a change that's going to cut across your entire system, it is not feasible to wait for people to redeploy because there are going to be services that are not being maintained by human beings anymore and no one's about to volunteer for that chore it's a nightmare, of, basically. of reintegrating, taking in months of code changes, making sure it still works and deploys. Yeah, they're going to quit right there. Yeah. I mean, no one it's wants infeasible. That. Yeah, it's not feasible. Right. Cool. Ben, ben, wanted you to be able to share a little bit about you know, founding Lightstep, you know, what, what's kind of the need in the market, and what, what you're seeing from your early customers. Sure, I mean, Lightstep is, uh, it, it has a pretty simple mission. We, we aim to deliver insights about very complex production software, which is commonplace at this point. Anyone who's building a meaningful business is building meaningful production software, and that means it's complicated. So that's, that's what we want to do. The way that we're doing that with our first product, Lightstep XPM, is by delivering root cause analysis for the symptoms that are of most interest to these businesses, regardless of their application architecture. As I said earlier, we have customers that run mainframes, as well as microservices at the same time, multi-cloud, doesn't matter. We follow transactions across these distributed services and use those to explain behaviors that, that they're puzzling over and, okay. and help them with uh, performance analysis and root cause analysis. And, and what's the relationship between the open source projects and uh, It's a great question. Solution. It's not a normal open core model. Open yeah. tracing is, is really an API project that's designed to ease integration with any number of vendors. And open tracing is supported by Lightstep, of course, but also by Jaeger and the uh, CNCF. It, uh, it's it's compatible with Zipkin, it's supported by uh, New Relic and Datadog, I'll give a shout out to some competitors. We're all in this together in the sense that I think we see that we all have a much bigger market as things like open tracing proliferate and make it easier to actually observe your own system. I would love to compete in the playing field of solutions and not worry so much about integration. So open tracing is an integration project. It's not our core technology. Our core IP is something that's very powerful that's designed to absorb a lot of information about these distributed systems and deliver value about that. And, and, when I, when I look at your website, T, kind of some of your early customers, I mean, jump out, you know, Lyft, Twilio, DigitalOcean, I mean, these are not, you know, kind of your typical companies. Is it, you know, fully kind of cloud native, you know, born on the web uh, type companies? I'm really glad you asked that, yeah. no. Um, yeah. I mean, most of our customers at this point are actually in a, a I've actually never seen a full microservices deployment, certainly not at one of our customers. It's always a combination of a monolith in the middle and microservices on the outside, but a lot of our customers are more traditional enterprises um, that you know, we haven't put on our website for logo rights reasons, but, but they, um, uh, they get a lot of value out of the solution. I would say even more value in some cases because they're um, dealing with a greater diversity of, of technology generations they need to cut across. Yeah, I want to go back, you, you mentioned uh, you know, the, the time for people these days and you talk about you know, developers and people building, you know, the, the fight for talent is, is huge out there. What are you seeing in your customers? Is that something that, that, that you help? How, how, how's kind of that interaction? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, DigitalOcean says they're saving, I think, a thousand engineer hours a month or something like that on Lightstep. It's a huge time saver for people who are trying to get to the bottom of issues. So that's a labor issue, but also a root cause analysis. I mean, every second counts. So seconds cost hundreds of thousands of dollars for some of our customers for any big outage, and so we help people get to those. Twilio is 
addressing incidents 92% faster after using LightStep, so it's a big change to the root cause analysis. Yeah, just there, there, was, there was a great quote I, I saw and said is, you know, um, when, when something goes wrong, it used to be you knew, now it turned into a murder mystery. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> so yeah. tell the story, why did you start the company? Was there an itch you were scratching? Were you saying, hey, you know, I've seen this movie before, I want to get out there, help customers. I mean, I heard your mission's really uh, straightforward, clean. Good, good, good positioning. But why start the company? What was the rationale? What was the, the motivation? Hey, that's a very easy one for me. I mean, my the reason I left Google was not necessarily to start a company per se. It was that I wanted to have as much of an impact on the industry as I could. I wanted to see things not just make money and siphon yeah. siphon cash away from companies, but actually to change the way software is built. And this first act for us, this product, is a way for us to kind of get into the tendril, yeah. get our get our system deep into uh, the the fabric of an application, and from that. Point. I'd like to see LightStep really change the way people build software. Yeah. I think people right now, it's almost like everyone's programming an assembly. Like, we're all trying to operate this level of the stack that's yeah. totally inappropriate, and I'd love to see LightStep be a, a part of the story for making the industry move like, up yeah. the value chain and really focus on building applications, and that, yeah. that's what I want to see us do. You know, we've been saying, I mean, first, we, get, we, we, we have a similar mission around our media business, but you know, one of the things we're seeing, we go to all the shows, sometimes it's like, why is the Cube covering you know, you know, Node.js, or why are you covering uh, Hadoop? And, 2010, yeah. why are you, because we see it early, we get, we get in early on some of these trends because we, we can see the innovation, we like it. But I got to tell you, we've been saying recently, and this, I've been saying it specifically, we see a huge renaissance in software development coming. Yeah, for sure. And my thesis, I want to test this with you because I think this is going to change the culture, certainly in Silicon Valley and around the world. Certainly with open source, it's exponentially growing. You know, Zemlin puts that stat up pretty clear. Old software development models was crafty, you build a product, you'd QA, you'd ship it, it either worked or it didn't work, and some art to it around ownership, and, and then Agile de-risked that mm -hmm. risk, but you can get it to the market quicker, and you listen to the data, you learn from the data, but it kind of took the craft out of it. You know what I'm saying? Almost like you're coding, we're iterating, we're on a treadmill, which is good, but now what, what we're seeing here is that you're getting back to abstracting away, to your point, all these services you don't need to worry about anymore. Mm -hmm. I can actually focus all my attention on the artisan aspect of the solution. Not UX, love user design, yeah. not that kind of art. We're talking about software art. Yeah. What's, your, what's your reaction to that? Do you see that coming? Because if this continues, we're going to have a whole class of software developers just essentially painting software art, if you will. Yeah. I mean, you almost, I mean that potentially is a scenario, your thoughts. Uh, yes, I agree with uh, that scenario <laughs> being feasible. <laughs> I, I, I think it's probably more than a couple of weeks away, but I'm really <laughs> excited about it. No, I, I think you're right on the money. I think a lot of the changes that we're seeing uh, allow people to operate more independently, and that, that's what motivated the transition to microservices in the first place. It wasn't just to, to rewrite everyone's software for fun. It was because we want everyone to be able to be independent of each other and to operate in that, in that mode. The thing that I think is exciting about that vision, which I would echo, is uh, a lot of the primitives that we see in the marketplace right now um, allow, allow developers to focus on the semantics of their application and the requirements of their application, which is where all the interesting stuff is and what we all get excited about. And I think we do see a lot of the, this is the number of people here right now, the investment as a, as a community and allowing developers to focus on, on the logic and nothing more is, is really tremendous and exciting to me. How has community changed? I, mean, I know you believe in community. Community is more important than ever now in this new model because there's so much leverage going on with the software. How important is community and what, how is it changing and how should it evolve to handle all this awesome growth? Yeah, I do have some thoughts about that. It's definitely important I mean, no one's going to deny that. I think one of the biggest challenges uh, that, that I think about anyway in this sphere has to do with um, build, I, I referred to this earlier. It's, it's important to figure out what problem you're solving with the community aspect of things. Like with Open Tracing, we thought really hard about this. Like, are we going to focus on on like the bits and bytes in the wire protocols or on the part that really needs to be standardized. I think community makes sense when standards are appropriate and standard interfaces are appropriate. I'm actually a little bit skeptical of community-driven solutions where it's, it, you're, you're delivering the entire package as a community because it ends up uh, intersecting in ways that are complex, I think, with business motivations. I think the most successful projects are areas where the community really must collaborate, which usually has 
has something to do with standardization. Those are the areas where I'm most excited. And then you actually literally, I was talking with Ken Goldberg yesterday, and they intentionally carve out areas for vendors to play because they, they don't want to kind of meddle in that area. It's actually better not yeah. to meddle in that area. And that's it's how like, it's, a, it's like microservices. You put the vendors over there, you put the yep. core computers over there. Ben Sigma, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Appreciate it. Congratulations on LightStep and you. the success in your talks here. Early community exploding, cloud native is a, not only a movement, it's clear to everyone, cloud and data and software and open source is making it happen easier, accelerating velocity. It's theCUBE, doing our part, bringing you the data here in Texas. I'm John Furrier with Stu Miniman. We'll be back with more live coverage after this short break. Thank you.